imagine if you went to a store, let's say the store is Best Buy. And when you got to Best Buy, you decided you were going to buy a new big screen TV so you can watch the Leafs in the playoffs next year. When you get up to the front of the store, you've, you've chosen your TV and you've put it on one of those carts, you roll it up the store and the cashier scans it through. Imagine, Bo, if they said this, hey, nice big screen TV. Are you going to pay for that big screen TV using cash or your debit card? Or are you going to take out a potentially crippling high interest loan with your credit card because you really don't have any money and can't afford that TV? I like to use the analogy, you know, a credit card is like a chainsaw. A chainsaw, if you use it properly for the right job, with the proper training and with the right safety equipment is a very valuable tool. If you use a chainsaw without the right equipment, without the right training, then it can do an awful lot of damage. This is the Personal Finance Show. Hi, I'm Bo Humphreys, and this is The Personal Finance Show. Robert Brown wants you to not be afraid of a little hard work. Robert grew up on a dairy farm. His father worked the farm while also working a full-time job at General Motors. Robert learned about working for money early and also about patience and delayed gratification. There are a lot of things that we buy today with borrowed money that we could easily put off until we have money in the bank. And we might even get a better deal if we wait. Robert realized over time that many Canadians hadn't learned what he did on the farm. And as a result, they were spending money before they earned it. And doing things like buying houses they actually couldn't afford. They didn't understand the concept of compound interest. Or how to save for the future while still being able to live a comfortable life today. After over 25 years of working in the restaurant and food service industries, Robert decided to write a book about personal finance. He would write it in a way that Canadians would understand. The book he wrote is called Wealthing Like Rabbits, and it's now a Canadian bestseller. Robert joined me from Ajax, Ontario, to share his personal finance story. was saying earlier, it was great that I didn't get a heads up on what we we're going to talk about. So this is going to be very real. <laughs> and when you, uh, you talk about my first real memory of a money thing, I first of all, think back to when I was 10 years old, because that was a life changing year for me. Okay. Uh, until I was 10, uh, I lived in Oshawa with my mom and dad and sister, you know, typical suburbia bungalow. My dad worked at the General Motors plant in Oshawa. And my father grew up on a farm. And when I was 10, my dad and mom decided they were going to move to a farm just outside Peterborough. So when I was 10, we moved from Oshawa to Peterborough. And I can remember my parents talking about the money part of that move and how they were going to pay for the farm and what they wanted to do on the farm to help generate some income. And would my father be able to continue to work at General Motors while he was, you know, growing this business on a farm. And I don't think I have to tell you, farming is a lot of work. Yeah. Well, what, what was the motivation uh, to go to a farm? I, I think if you were to ask my dad then, he didn't want to just raise his children in a suburban environment. He wanted them to have the work ethic experience of growing on a farm. Hmm. And he wanted to accomplish more than just the nine to five. Not there's anything wrong with that to, uh, to pull into Seinfeld. But uh, <laughs> this is kind of like uh, him starting his own business and going back to his own childhood. And I can actually remember him wondering how long it would take for him to get to work from his farm in Peterborough to uh, General Motors in Oshawa. And I can remember driving our car down to the plant in Oshawa on a Saturday and timing how long it would take to get to our farm in Peterborough, which was just over an hour and a half drive each way. I can actually remember him doing the drive to time it. And he kept working? Did he do that? Yeah. Yeah, my dad worked at General Motors until his 30th anniversary, which is when I guess they get the, the bigger, better pension. So my dad 
ran a full-time dairy farm and I, I, I shouldn't leave my mom out. My mom and dad yeah. ran a full-time dairy farm while my dad continued to work full-time at General Motors wow. uh, until he retired. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess some numbers here, Bull, but I'm going to sure. say he worked at both for 10 or 12 years. And I might be off a little bit, but not too much. And it's funny, we talk about work ethic and the things oh. you want to do to accomplish some of your goals. I had an opportunity to roast my father at an event a couple of years ago. Oh, fun. It was a riot. But I yeah. also remember, also, you know, a roast done well is also a tribute because sure. I can remember my dad, and when I was a kid, getting out of bed at like 4.30, quarter to five in the morning, having a quick shower and coffee, getting in his car, driving to Peterborough where he meets five other guys and they'd all get in a van, drive to Oshawa, work his eight or nine hour shift at the motors, get in a car, come back, drive out to the farm. And within five minutes of getting back to the farm at, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon, he'd be on a tractor plowing a field until after dark, 10 o'clock, coming in, having a quick bite to eat, a shower, crashing in bed and doing it the next day. In the meantime, the actual dairy farm, we had a dairy farm, we had cows, we milked cows twice a day. That actual operation of the, 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 the dairy piece, milking the cows morning and night, that responsibility fell on my mom and my sister and I. So uh, real life lessons about, you know, sometimes how hard you need to work in order to achieve your goals. And the goal was to provide a, a better life experience for you guys? <laughs> Yeah, a better life experience for my sister and I and, you know, a better life experience for them now that they're, you know, semi-retired. My parents still live on the farm that I grew up with. My dad is 82 and my mom will turn 80 this year. And while it's not an operating dairy farm anymore, they still use it to cash crop out. Now, another farmer down the road wants to buy some hay. My dad's not doing that anymore, but he'll sell the hay that's in the field to another farmer. So it is, it's yeah. kind of that passive income that we talk about all the time in retirement. My dad just got that uh, way ahead of rest of the curve. And, and the investment, I, I was working two jobs for uh, that 10, yeah. 10 to 12 years, as you said. And listen, anybody that's going to get involved in a small family farm isn't doing it for the money or no, certainly yeah. not exclusively for the money. Because if you were to take, if you were actually able to do the math, which is impossible and figure out how much money you make per hour of work, I'll bet you'd cry. Uh, but it's also but it's also a lifestyle. You know, yeah. it really is to live out in the country and to work with the animals and, and use your hands in the field and get your hands dirty and be able to teach your kids some work ethic. And to this day, I'm over 50 now, Bo, and uh, I still use the, the experience that I learned growing up on the farm every day. And I mean that in a couple of ways. First of all, I'm not my father. I don't, a farming life full time is not for me. But I really like to believe I carry that work ethic with me. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very, very resistant to get someone to, to pay someone to do something for me if I can do it myself, which is absolutely a farmer attitude. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that, that upbringing. And I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. At some point in this conversation, I think we're going to end up talking about my wife and I's cottage. I'm the same way up there. You know, I like to get my hands dirty. I like that almost acoustic process of, of doing things yourself rather than just getting your checkbook out to do them. Whether or not you can afford it. Well, it's such a contrast to, to where we are today, right? With the yeah. majority of people, like I, you know, I drive Uber on the side and I was driving someone this morning who said not only is it more convenient, but it's like the better choice for them to order food with Uber Eats like on a daily basis. And I'm sure you have something to say about that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I spent far too much time on the, uh, on the, on the Twitter machine and I, and I see all those posts and articles and I'm very, very hesitant to judge without having deep information. Yeah. And, and even then I try not to be judgmental, but yeah, at the same time, when I see somebody saying that they're getting all their meals through Uber Eats and they're not able to take out a pot and pan and cook some meals for themselves. I said, you know, I would just love to get a spreadsheet out and do the math on that because I just guarantee there's money to be saved. And, and again, you know, I go out for dinner now and then. I order food in now and then. I'm not above that. But my breakfast this morning before we had this podcast was, you know, me putting a pan on the stove and frying up some bacon and scrambling up a couple of eggs. And, you know, I, I survived the experience. <laughs> yeah, well, it, you're right. It, it, everybody's situation is different. And, of course, it depends. But I, I, I was thinking when this person told me this, 
the 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 better option that she decided for her is probably not financially based. Yeah, and guess what? Even for us personal finance people, not all decisions should be financially based. Good point. You know, I, I, I think that it's a factor, but if we made all of our decisions based strictly on what was the right thing to do financially, we'd <laughs> never leave our house. We'd That's never right. go to a movie. We'd, you know, we'd, we'd walk. We'd never buy a car. We'd live in a tent, you know? So there has to, there has to be that balance. But no, I'm always very resistant to the you only live once theory. So I'm, I'm always big on the balancing of your, of your, you know, your current lifestyle against your needs of the future. And it always comes back to the farm for me because farming is, is a great lifestyle to teach you work ethic and that sort of thing. But it's also a great lifestyle to teach you how to deal with adversity. I don't think there's any occupation that can be as cruel as farming. And when it's great, it's great. It really is. And there's nothing like being a 14 year old boy and it's that brilliant summer day, much like the one we have here today. Mm -hmm. And you just help your parents bring in 2,000 bales of hay. And, you know, you're young and you're healthy. And that's a great feeling of accomplishment for 14 year olds. But there's also days when things don't go well on the farm if an if an animal should die or though the weather doesn't cooperate oh, there's no the weather no industry in the world dependent on whether it's farming and uh and 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 you're forced to do things that you would rather not do because the circumstances dictate that so you get very good at handling adversity well you know and i'm not you know recommending that to someone but at, at the same time i would say those lessons have stood me well because when something goes wrong at the cottage or in my life, I tend to be able to step back, reflect on it and say, well, that sucks, but that's life and let's deal with it and let's learn from it. And so we don't make this mistake again and, and move on. Yeah. That, that, what a great exper early experience for you. And so you worked on the farm then for, for how long, like throughout high school? Yeah, I was on the farm uh, throughout high school, but, you know, I don't want to paint a picture of uh, Canadiana doing nothing but on the farm. You know, obviously I went to high school and when I was a teenager too, and again, I'm going to give my parents big kudos here. I uh, had an interest in flying. So I joined air cadets when I was 14 oh. and, and that was another big influence on my life. And by the time I was 17 and 18, I wasn't spending my summers on the farm anymore. I was off at air cadet camp, learning how to fly gliders and learning how to fly airplanes. And even as I got into late high schools, working as a counselor or you know, a staff member at the camp. So I wasn't on the farm often during the summer, which is when a lot of the work has to be done. But my parents recognized that just because they had made a decision to uh, have a farm full time, that I still needed to explore my own boundaries as well. And, and, and at the time, you know, when you're a teenager, there was some, and I'm making the quotation marks as I say this, <laughs> conflicts because I always wanted to be out doing my own things. And there were times my parents put their foot down and said, hey, no, you were out Monday night and Tuesday night. We need some help on Wednesday. See, so you're going to stay here and give us a hand when, you know, when you're 17, you, uh, you're so selfish, you think everything's about you. But uh, <laughs> in hindsight, they were very, very balanced about how they treated me and that gave me that life experience. And yeah, so to, to, to follow up your question, I lived on the farm until I was in my early 20s. I had finished high school and, you know, I'd gone off to college and uh, I, I went to college in Peterborough, but, you know, at 21, 22, I decided that I, I didn't want to live on the farm anymore. That it was time for me to get out on my own. And my parents would agree, not in a bad way, but, you know, young people need to spread their wings. And so a buddy and I shared an apartment in Peterborough during my last year of college, and I haven't lived at home since. Okay. And, and so do you remember the first time that you, sorry, you wouldn't get paid for any of this uh, work on the farm, right? So you're not actually making cash? No, no, I did get paid. Oh, you, you know, did? For, okay. Yeah. You know, I, and, and I think when I was 10 and 11 and 12, my parents just gave me some money so that they, so that I could see the relationship between work yeah. and getting paid, but it wasn't a salary. But as I got older, you know, 15, 16, 17, and yeah. needed money to support my, my lifestyle, I had the option of going out and getting a part-time job or I could work on the farm. So yeah. we worked at a deal that I would get paid to work on the farm rather than work off the farm. Now, okay. by the time I got to late high school, I'd had enough of milking cows and, yeah, uh, yeah. and doing that sort of thing. So eventually I did start to get part-time jobs as well. But no, my, my parents definitely paid me when I was working on the farm. Well, that's good. So, so 
what did they teach you or did they teach you anything about what to do with that money once you got it? You know what? I don't remember any conversations specifically about that, but you know, we talk all the time about the influences our parents have and how we do things that, that nurture versus nature debate. Yeah. And you know, it comes back to the farming experience. You know, farmers are very good at making do with what they have. And my parents, well, you know, were frugal. They had to be, you know, farming is a difficult way to make a living. So they didn't spend money wastefully, you know, the, yeah. the, when, they, when they bought groceries, uh, when they bought groceries, they chose things that were healthy and cost efficient. There was no just going to the grocery store and filling up the cart randomly. And the whole car thing. My parents bought new cars because my dad worked at General Motors and got the employee discount and okay, thought deal, that was yeah. the greatest gig in the world. And <laughs> I'm not, I'm not so sure, but nevertheless, <laughs> but once he bought it, you know, he, they, they milked it to death. You know, my, yeah. my parents just sold the car that I learned to drive on five years ago. What? Wow. Okay. Now, now in fairness, they weren't driving at all those times. No. My, if anybody out there is into like 1960s cars, this is a cool story. Yeah. But the car that I learned to drive on was a 1969 Chevrolet Chevelle two-door hardtop with the 350 engine, but the 396 Sport package in it. So that's a cool car. And uh, my dad had it sitting in the barn. Like he drove it for 15 years. We put almost 200,000 miles on it, yeah. which is a lot for cars of that era. And then my dad backed it away and put it in a barn for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. You know, it was that barn find for somebody. And eventually some guy came out and dad showed him the car. And he wrote dad a great big check for this classic car. And I was a little pissed because I wanted that car someday. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But that, that's the car story. But the same thing, you know, when our cars broke down, which didn't happen often, we didn't automatically go to the garage to get a guy to fix it. My dad was a, a handy mechanic guy and farmers fix things themselves. So yeah. I can tell you that I have spent time in the garage, you know, underneath a jacked up truck, pulling the transmission out and helping put the new transmission in. You never forget experiences like that. So you took on this frugality yourself then, or did you rebel at some point too? Uh, you know what? Uh, no, I wouldn't say I rebelled. I was a I was a teenager and I was a young twenty something, like so many other people. If I had a dollar for every dollar I spent on beer in my twenties, I'd probably be <laughs> a wealthier man right now. But I was never out of control. I can't say that I've never had credit card debt in my life, but I was never bad at it. I, for the most part, I can say that I've lived within my means. That I take that frugality approach that my parents taught me on the farm uh with the frugality in mind then and not maybe not a lot of money available uh, how was school paid for uh, how, how did that come about i think my parents paid for my first year of college i went to a three-year program in hospitality management at the local college in peterborough okay i'm in college and uh by then i was working part-time on my own. And, and, and that's where the work ethic story kicked in. I didn't have one part-time job while I went to college. I had four. Okay. Wow. I delivered pizzas at a pizza place that was owned by a friend. Wow. I worked as a lifeguard at the pool at the college. And uh, I also spent some spare time still helping air cadets in, in, in a staff role. So I had a lot of things going on to, to bring money in. Wow. Okay. So, and, and, and uh, tuition, uh, everyone tells me that it wasn't crazy like it is now anyway. Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. It was, you know, I remember thinking at the time it's a lot of money, but relative to what tuition is now, it's very inexpensive. It's a lot easier to go to school then than it is now. So you spent, I mean, obviously you had some fun. You talked about the beer, but you spent a lot of time working as well. Yeah. And uh, it's funny, I was talking to a friend a couple of weeks ago whose son is at university and we talked about, you know, it's a great debate about whether or not a, a kid should work part time yeah, while question. they're going to to college or university. And I've always been a strong advocate that yes, it's good for a student to work part time while they're going to college and university for a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm sure there are exceptions, but most students do not study and do not do homework and assignments every hour that they're out of school. So That's it's right. tough to convince me in most situations that they don't have time to. Yeah, now, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't fill it with more study time. You're absolutely right. Right. <laughs> right. Now, finding a job that you know, fits into their schedule, that can be challenging. I understand that. But a lot of 
part-time places need student help. So they're willing to be pretty flexible in terms of hours as long as the other party is too. And so A, you know, it gives you a break. Working can be a social experience as well. You get to know the people you work with and you have fun and you, you get a break from school. So when you come back to that study or that assignment or that essay or that whatever, you come back with a fresh mind. C, you're, you're making money, which, you know, has to help out. But D, the unforgotten part is while you're working, you don't have time to go out and spend money. So you're making it and you're certainly not spending it. So I'm a, a big advocate of students working part time while they go to college or university. My own son's just finishing up his three year program at college and he's okay. worked part time through the entire thing and it hasn't been a, a big problem yet. Sure, there's been a couple of times where he's had big assignments due, so he's had to give up a shift. But for the most part, no, nothing to it. That's a, that's probably the best uh, uh, argument that I've heard so far. Very detailed. You've obviously put some thought into that, and uh, you know, having a son in university. Yeah, but but again, I, I I'm going to keep pulling it back to the farm experience, Bo. Absolutely. I, people say they don't, you know, want to work part time. It's like you know, it's like work is such a bad thing. Well, I like my part time jobs. I have friends at my part time jobs. It wasn't a horrific experience for me. I don't think working has to be a terrible thing. Were there bad nights? You bet. But overall, I, I liked working. So it wasn't a, a, a hardship for me. Yeah, that's it, right? You know, I, um, I'm i sure you you know Derek Foster. And I've, yeah. I've read uh, uh, his books. Uh, I, I mean, read, I say, but I probably skimmed most of them. But, uh, you know, he always positioned work as just the worst possible thing ever. Uh, yeah. w and that's why he was just working in until he could retire at 34, I guess. And I think we're we got to shift that now because you can't. Uh, you know, you can't just be like work yourself to death and then, uh, you know, at 65 or whenever you can retire, then you start your life, right? Find work yeah. that we enjoy. Yeah. And, and you know what? I, I would never advocate somebody stay in a position or a job or a career that they absolutely hate it day in and day out. I don't, you know, I don't want anybody to be unhappy in their life. But at the same time, if you like your job, but you have a few shitty days, well, yeah. Find me a job that doesn't have that. That's Find right. me one, yeah. you know, they're, they're pretty rare. As long as it doesn't uh, co constantly make you miserable, right? Yeah, I, of course. I don't want anybody to be unhappy. And if it's like a horrible environment or you just hate what you want to do and, you know, you, you've, you've thought that through and you want to move on to something else, well, of course, you know, but balance. So so you're not really uh, able to save any money quite yet, but you're, no, you're, you're moving out of the house, which means you have some income. Yeah, I've got some income from all my part-time jobs, and I'm I'm going to school, and uh, I'm I'm certainly independent. I'm I'm surviving on my own. But, yeah, but it just you're covering the bases, and yep. you're you're finished. When you finish your program, do you get the job in hospitality? In in uh, what was it? What was the program called? Hospitality management. So uh, I I uh, I was working in the restaurant business. Yeah, I went to a job fair in Toronto from Peterborough. Okay. And this was, I'm going to date myself big time now, but this <laughs> was in 1987. And 1987 was the first year that Red Lobster came to Canada. Oh, really? And they were big. Oh, I didn't know yep. that. Yeah, well, uh, that's what I'm here for, Bo, to give you this detailed <laughs> information about Red Lobster. I'll look at Wikipedia it later. And I went to uh, this job fair with, you know, a bunch of resumes and handed out a bunch of resumes, and I got a call from the Human Resources Department at Red Lobster, and they were opening a store in Peterborough. I had never been to a Red Lobster in my entire life. Oh, wow. So I said, no, I'll go to the interview, and I went to the interview, and it seemed to go okay. They were obviously hungry for young managers because they were opening like 60 stores across Canada or something crazy like that. Yeah. And I, and I accepted a job at Red Lobster Canada in 1987, having never ever been in one of their restaurants. The day I got the job, <laughs> I signed the deal. My friends and I went to the Red Lobster in Peterborough and drank too much. It was, uh, it was great. <laughs> so what, were you the manager? I was the junior super assistant shift manager at that time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because yeah. you had the, the college degree, they would start you off at, in a yeah. sort of a managerial and, supervisory role. Yeah. And you know what? Say what you will about Red Lobster. I worked there for 13 years in totality. Wow. And uh, their training programs were as good as anybody else's in the industry. I don't regret the experience. If I could go back and live my life over again, 
I think I probably would have left Red Lobster sooner than I did. I think the last five or six years, I was just really putting in time. But that's not the same thing as saying I regret the experience. I learned a ton there, and I like to work. So restaurant business is not an easy business either. I tend to gravitate to a hard, hardworking fields. Sure. But sure. yes, seven days a week, every day except for Christmas Day, you know. Wow. And, uh, and, you know, the restaurant opens at 11 and closes at 10 that night. And there are other restaurants, as you know, that open earlier and stay open later. That was one of the big advantages if you're in the chain restaurant business of working for a Red Lobster. They closed at 10. They weren't a bar. But I met a ton of friends there. I still have friends that work there. I met my wife there. So, again, don't regret the experience at all. Wow, okay. So 13 years is, is a long time to be in one organization. I'm assuming not at the same store. No, no. I worked at probably six or seven stores, most of them in that Oshawa, Peterborough, Pickering sort of corridor where I still live now. But they, as needs demanded, they kind of flipped me back and forth between those three stores. And what was the, just quickly, what was the progression of your roles, if you can just rhyme them off? I, I, I went up the management scale. I was the super junior assistant manager. Then I was the associate manager. Then, then for the last part of my career, I was running the store. Yeah. Okay. So what do you, what do you know about personal finance at this point while you're, while you're working or while you're starting? Is there anything yeah. like, do you have any guidelines that you're following? Yeah. Well, not, not in the beginning, but no. again, it was a full-time job with benefits. They paid you benefits. Sure. And I started out at $23,000 a year, which was huge money for me. Sounds like then. a lot. Yeah. 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 And, well, and it was at the time, you know, it wasn't the money that a lawyer would make, but it was a, it was a good paycheck every week and it was a salary paycheck. So it always came in. I didn't have to worry about my hours, which was good because I was working a lot of those hours. Well, let's just pause and acknowledge that you don't have any debt, right? Right. And that, right. that's, that's huge, right? Well, it, no, that's, that's, that's not quite true. Okay. Though. You had some? Quite true. Yeah, a little bit. When I, when I, when I got the job at Red Lobster, I had thought it would be appropriate to get rid of the uh, beater car that I was driving. Ah, Okay. And remember, my dad worked at General Motors, and, and I think he was done at the Motors by now, but he still gets the employee discount. So uh, we went to the local Chevrolet dealership, and I brought my first new car, a 1987 Chevrolet Chevette. Oh, wow, brand I new. Car. Yeah, and I think it cost about six grand at the time. So you got a car loan then? And I got a, a bank loan for a car loan for three years, and that's important to a story coming up later. But oh. I did have a car loan for my first ever new car okay. and that's that is the only new car i have ever owned <laughs> so it's not just rent uh that you're having to pay you have do you have this other obligation and yep. of course you got to feed yourself and all that do yep. you recall um having any savings were you able to build up any savings at this point no i was definitely paycheck to paycheck i was able to make my car payments no problem and and i still shared an apartment with a buddy so i was able to uh, pay rent without any issue and we just basically lived off the rest until in 1989, I was living in Oshawa with my friend who had been to uh, visit his mom and dad in Picton, Ontario. And when he came back, he had a copy of this book called The Wealthy Barber. Ah, 89. 89. Wow. Well, when, and, was it, when was it written? Was it written then? Uh, I think it was written, I think Dave wrote it, 89, maybe 88. This was pretty early in the whole Wealthy Barber thing. Yeah, okay. And, uh, I read it cover to cover in about two weeks. It was a life-changing moment. You know, that's when my whole interest in personal finance started. Wow, awesome. And, you know, Dave Chilton is kind of the, can I say the godfather of yeah. uh, personal finance in Canada? Yeah, I would say. But I was struck at the time by just how clever it was. And I'm still struck by it today to take those fundamental personal finance lessons and weave them into this cheesy little anecdotal story one lesson at a time every two weeks while they got their haircut. So you can break it down into piecemeal pieces. I thought it was brilliant then. I still think it's brilliant now. But I bought in. I uh, thought, wow, that makes sense. Now, what's important here, Bo, is remember the car loan? It is almost over now. I've almost finished paying off the car. This okay. is about three years in. So... I've been making these car payments on this Shabbat that I'm still driving. Yep. And I've had no trouble making these car payments on this Shabbat that I'm driving. My income has gone up a little bit. 
And I read this book where this guy tells me if I start saving for my future now in this thing called an RRSP, <laughs> that potentially by the time I'm 50, I could have over a million dollars. That is just so clear to me. So as soon as I'm done paying off the car, I go into my bank and I say to the bank person at the age of, how old was I now? 22, 23, 24 in there somewhere. All right. I say, listen, man, my car loan's paid off. I want to open an RRSP and I want to take the exact same amount of money that was going toward the loan and I want to automatically put it in that every month because this book I read says we can do it automatically. This is the extent <laughs> of my knowledge. So smart, okay? though. And the guy said, yeah, we can do that. And he said, he looks at me and he goes, how old are you? <laughs> 24, 25, whatever I was. And he said, man, if every 24, 25 year old I ever met came in and made this decision, the world would be a different place in 20 years. Seriously. And that's where my whole interest in personal finance started, right? In that two months period, whatever it was. Amazing. And, and uh, that's when I started my savings plan. And then at some point I reread The Wealthy Barber and I realized that even though the money I was putting in was a good step, I could do better because I was allowed to contribute up to 18%. So I got out a calculator and did the math and figured out, remember I'm salaried at Red Lobster, so it's not hard to figure out what 18% is. Yep. And um, started putting away 18% of my income every two weeks, which is what I got paid. And boy, I can say honestly that I put away 18% of my income every paycheck I got until about five years ago. Wow. So you maxed out your RSP contributions yeah. from the beginning. Yeah. That yeah. is, and, and inspired by this. Now, of course, the question I have to ask is, what did the bank put your money in? The bank put my money into a very, very high-priced mutual fund because that's where <laughs> I told them to put it because, <laughs> sorry, Dave, that's what the wealthy barber said. And, it, you know, th that's not fair. The bank, the, Dave or the bank did not say a wealthy mutual fund, but I put it into a mutual fund that appeared to have a good track record, which yeah. is what Dave said. And, uh, and, and that mutual fund was hauling me for probably two, two and a half percent in fees right away. Yeah. Well, yeah, but there weren't many options at that time either, right? Well, there weren't many options at the time. But I also remember I said, this is where my interest in personal finance started. So then I started reading all the other books out there. And at the time, there weren't very many. There's tons of them now. Yeah. But I started reading the Globe and Mail. And I started reading the personal finance section in the Star. And I started to build my knowledge. And yeah, sometime in the late 90s the the globe and the the paper started to point out that you know the the fees on mutual funds were hurting returns and that you could do better by moving it over to an index fund so i'm going to think that i was probably ahead of the curve on index funds i did move that money over a little bit quicker oh, okay but the other thing that i would say is because i know the wealthy barber and even dave chilton in his second book recognizes that the fees that were paid in mutual funds that he recommended weren't necessarily the best thing. There weren't a lot of other options at the time. Yeah. And I would argue that people who put money into their RRSP and overpaid for mutual funds from 1987 till 2000 were still a lot better off than people who didn't invest anything. That's right. You, you right. just get started. The fact that you got started in your 20s yeah. And, yeah. and you were consistent. And it yeah. doesn't seem like you had any kind of uh, matching or any, any plan from uh, Red Lobster. Not at that time. They did introduce one into my career further, and I had to adjust based on that. Uh, and the second company I went to after I ref, ref, ref Red Lobster, after I left Red Lobster, um, had a plan as well. But by then, I was getting, you know, I'd done enough. I was getting pretty good at doing the math. So I made adjustments to take advantage of employee sponsor plans later. Yeah, that's and of course that you probably recommend that always. It's uh, often a hundred percent return immediately, depending on the company, right? You know what? I didn't mention that in my book. I should have. That was a, that was a <laughs> miss on my part. Now I'm thinking about a sequel, Bo, and that's yeah. actually on my list to talk about because I, uh, I I did it. I just didn't think to put it in. To jump ahead, you're are you actively uh, writing a sequel right now? I think it's fair to say I'm actively planning the sequel right okay. now. I've got some notes, but I haven't actually sat down and started to write. But my goal is, and, and don't hold me to this, my goal is to release the sequel in the fall of 2021. I okay. write slow. Amazing, amazing. I, I, I am slow, so I write slow. <laughs> and and we, will, we will get to the book, uh, you know, not, not far from now, I guess. Yeah. So, okay, you're consistently putting away this 18%. Yeah. 
and was and then you you said you met your wife uh, while yep. working at Red Lobster, so between yep. eighty seven and two thousand, somewhere in there. Yep. Did you guys consider a home ownership? Was that the first one of the first things? Well, no, we 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 didn't do things in the in the normal oh, fashion. Okay. And, and I'm not going to suggest that we did things the right way, but I think we did things in at least a considered way. Interesting. When we got together, I was renting. And she was living in a house that she owned with her ex. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, they, they had divorced and they were separating and that sort of thing. But she said that, that house ownership thing still hadn't been settled. And when they wrapped up all of their finances, you know, Belinda didn't come to our relationship with any debt, but she didn't come with a lot of assets either. So it was yeah. kind of a clean slate for her. Sure. And I, and I had some savings outside of my RSP, tax-free savings accounts didn't exist then. No. The first summer we were seeing each other, we were looking for something to do with the kids. She had two little girls, seven and nine, age seven and nine at the time. Oh, wow. And I, and I was working at the Red Lobster in Peterborough. And a friend, a staff member said that his aunt had a cottage about an hour north of Peterborough that they rented out for the weekends. So, you know, was that something we were interested in? I said, sure, I'm in. I would love to go to a cottage. I love the lake experience. Mm -hmm. So we made all the arrangements stuff and we took the girls up for a cottage weekend at this tiny little island cottage up in the middle of nowhere. And that was fun. And the next summer after that, we did that Again, and by now we were together and we were renting a place in Ajax where we live today. Yeah. And we decided to do the cottage thing again. We'd, we'd rent it, but not for a weekend this time. This time we decided to rent it for a full week. We made those arrangements and I took my vacation. We went up and one morning early, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of an early riser. I decided to go for a canoe ride on a gorgeous summer day. It's a small lake, so I put the canoe in and you know went for a little paddle the other side of the lake and found this beat up handyman special cottage that was for sale. <laughs> All right. It was a unique property. And in that when you, when you were sitting in the canoe from the lake, you could tell that no one had been there in years. The, the property itself was terribly overgrown and the dock was in terrible repair. And it was this old wood frame cottage that had electricity, but didn't have like a lot else going on. And I look over at the real estate sign and they're three deep. In other words, it's been listed by three different agents. And oh, this, nice. is in, this is in 1998, 1999. The, the real estate market had taken a bit of a hit at the time. So I go, well, this is kind of interesting. And I, I parked the canoe on the shore and you know got a little nosy and started to walk around, right? And you could sort of peer in through the windows of this place. And I mean, it's in the woods out in the middle of the boonies. It sounds terrifying. That was great. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I could tell looking in there that there was nothing modern in this cottage at all. And no one had been in there in forever. Everything looked like it was from 1960, the big old sectional with the spinning lazy Susan in the center and <laughs> yeah. Tupperware everywhere. And it was just a mess, but it's on a Stunning lot, like the view of the lake okay. is southern exposure, nice outcroppings, and uh, oh, that's kind of cool. I got back in my canoe and paddled back and saw Belinda and said, "Hey, I, I went for a canoe ride. Saw this, you know, cool old cottage for sale, you know," and and that was that. <laughs> and the next summer we come back, same thing happened. I, I took the canoe up for a little paddle, and it's still for sale, and it's been in the back of my head. All winter. You've been thinking about this. Wow. I've been thinking about it, right? And this time I go, same thing. Nothing had changed. Same agent. I go, wow, you know what? That'd be kind of cool. I wonder if there's a deal to be had here, right? Mm, yeah. We haven't bought a house yet. We're still renting. And <laughs> Belinda and I took that, called the real estate agent, got a little information about the cottage and, and lot and concession and did a title search on the property and found out that, that the lot that the cottage sat on had been bought from the crown in 1953 from the person who still owned it today. Oh. And they had bought the lot for $70.26. <laughs> that number is engraved in my head because we visited this guy, the, 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 the clerk at the office. I saw the number on the page and I go, what's that? Was that the transfer fee? He goes, no, no. <laughs> That's what they paid for the lot. Oh wow. my God. That winter came along just after Christmas in January 
And uh, we called the agent, said, is the, that cottage still for sale? She goes, oh yeah, yeah, still for sale. I said, well, we'd like to make an offer. We made a ridiculously low offer, like yeah. half the price they were asking for it. Knowing that it had been for sale for four years and knowing that the person who was selling the cottage <laughs> had been there for 40 some years and hadn't had any luck yeah. and our offer was soundly rejected didn't even come okay. back we said, oh is it okay you know whatever i'll spare you the story but another year goes by another <laughs> summer at the college and the next winter we make the exact same offer almost a year later and this time she came back with a counter offer that was only marginally above what we had said we would pay and we took it so we had bought a cottage before we bought a house. It was a, the ultimate fixer-upper cottage. Well, this is a, definitely a, a good example of delayed gratification. You were like, I want this, but only if it's reasonable, only if we can afford it. And there's a couple of lessons in there as well. It's also to come back to that farm ethic. I knew this cottage was going to be a ton of work. Yes, yes. But that was a project that I was willing to take on. You know, I was in my early 30s, full of piss and vinegar, and decided that I, I could do this. You know, <laughs> for my for, for my new family, we were obviously a couple at this point, and two little girls that liked the college experience. So this was a that 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 bucket list thing. But at the same time, we never once during the process of buying the cottage, raising the children, fixing up the cottage never stop making RSP contributions. <laughs> the, the deal we made with ourselves when we decided to do this, and obviously there was a lot of conversations that, A, we wouldn't sacrifice our future. We would take our time to fix up the cottage as many years as it took, that we were not going to stop making contributions for our future. And B, we weren't going to go into debt to fix it up. We were going to have to work hard, earn the money, figure it out, and do it along the way. And with very few exceptions, we have stayed true to that to this day. So you bought it with cash that you had? Yes and no. I had some cash saved up and I was also able to sell my half of an airplane I owed. I skipped that story, but that, that's another story. A buddy and I shared an airplane together and I sold my half of the airplane to buy the cottage. Wow. I mean, I feel like we should go back to that, but I think we need to move forward. <laughs> so you didn't have a mortgage? No, no. In fact, the, the price we paid for the cottage was so inexpensive. Yeah. The bank, the bank didn't want to give us a mortgage. <laughs> they wanted to give us a line of credit. And so, Amazing. But, but between our savings and the money we were able to put together, remember we had two years to plan for it because she didn't take it, right? Yeah. We were, able, we were able to virtually pay for the cottage upfront. Plus we, you know, we got it at a great, great price. Need a lot of work, but we got it at a great price. So we, we did not have a mortgage on the cottage and it was completely paid for in less than a year. Oh, amazing. And you, then you just gave yourself the time to however long it would take to make it livable. Did you still rent uh, cottages uh, as you were fixing it up then? No, crazy man. No, we we lived in the cottage while we were fixing it up. You know, okay. There was no way I was going to be paying to live in somebody <laughs> else's cottage while I'm fixing it up. When you got your own property, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, was it like camping out a lot of it or? I went up there initially on my own. It's a water access cottage bowl, meaning you have to take a boat over to get okay, it. Okay, yeah. Farm stories, farm work ethic stories. I was still working at Red Lobster at the time and there was, there was days that I would finish up at the restaurant at 11.30, 12 o'clock at night, hop in my Chevette, which is well paid for now, drive up north to the cottage and get there at 1.30 in the morning, put the boat in the water, put the outboard motor on the boat, fire it up, and then toot, 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 toot across the lake at 1.30 in the morning so that I could get up at 9 and start working on the cottage. I did that a number of times. You're your you're dad. I, I it, it didn't fall off the tree. What's that expression? The apple yeah, doesn't fall, far doesn't off, fall the tree. far from the tree. Absolutely. So you got this cottage you're fixing up. You're working at Red Lobster, but you stopped. Where, where, where did you get a job after Red Lobster? What happened? Uh, yeah, you know, after 13 years of uh, signing coupons and counting shrimp, I decided it was time to move <laughs> on to something else. And I moved to, uh, I, was, I still stayed in the food business, but I moved on to food service distribution and sales. I moved on to selling foods to restaurants as opposed to just working in the restaurants. A little bit better lifestyle in terms of hours, more opportunity for better income, and certainly a change for me. And you understand the business so well after 13 years. I knew the business, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. The, so how long did you do that for? 13 years. So another 13 years. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I moved to a number of positions within that company. And 
And uh, I was their training manager, their sales training manager for a number of years. And to make a long story short, there was some uh, downsizing at the company. And I was given a choice of uh, applying for a different job or taking a severance package. And I chose to take the severance package at that time because I was releasing a book and decided I would try a third career around its message. Okay, so that's the timeline there. So when during those 13 years you start something starts bubbling like i i'm i think i'm going to write a book i i think there should be a book that i should write about personal finance yeah well during those 13 years belinda and i did eventually buy a house okay. and uh you know so the house that i'm sitting in right now as a matter of fact you know we started to think a little more seriously about mortgages and how they work and because of my nature how aggressively we would work toward paying off that mortgage while continuing to fix up the cottage, while continuing to save money for the girls' education, and while continuing to live a balanced lifestyle. And, and you're contributing to your RSPs consistently. <laughs> and contributing to RSPs consistently and, and, and all that stuff. Now, in terms of the book, writing a book was always a bucket list thing for me. That was just an itch I had to scratch. And I'd been talking about that since I was in my 20s. I I was that guy at work that never <laughs> never said in, in a three three sentence email what could be said in a you know a full page email. I, I like that <laughs> that that challenge of putting something down in words and and making it expressive. My first attempt at writing a book wasn't around personal finance at all. I actually started to write a book about some of the experiences I had growing up on the farm. Yeah, but I also realized that was a pretty limited market, and that was as much a, a vanity project as anything else. So I. I put that on the back burner. I've still got those notes. I may come back to it someday. Sure. But um, I looked around my own office and uh, my wife said, you know, you talk about how big of influence uh, David Chilton's book was. You've got all these other personal finance books here. You know, you're always expressing opinions on this subject. You've got two girls that are going off that are in university right now. Why don't you take a crack at writing a money book that's going to be aimed at people in, you know, that, that high school university years between late, uh, late teens and and 30 ish. And that's where the idea started. Okay. And I made I made some notes that day. And uh, I joked that the the impetus of the book was when I was reading the newspaper. And in the star that day, there was that article that we we used to see every year on the Toronto Maple Leafs that if the Toronto Maple Leafs win the next 12 game straights, and if this team loses four games, then maybe the Leafs will win the playoffs. And I'm like, Yeah, right. That's gonna happen every year. And I go to the business section and there was another article in the paper about how Canadians are trying to find ways to save the money in March so they can max out their RSPs. And I had, that's going to happen. They should have started back in September. And I kind of <laughs> thought, you know what? There's an idea to merge those two ideas together, to use it as a teaching point. And that's really where the whole idea started. And that, that is actually the analogy I use in the pay yourself first section of the book. Yeah, yeah. So the book is called Wealthing Like Rabbits. If you could uh, just talk about the the title and why and why rabbits. Well, you know, you would think that when someone writes a book, they have a, a title for it right up front, and they have this defined plan, and they start at chapter one and they write through to 12, chapter twelve. <laughs> and I'm I'm sure that's the way most people did it. But I didn't have a title for my book when I started to write it. I did have a good outline of the subjects I wanted to cover, and I stayed pretty true to that bow. But I started with uh, the chapter on houses, on mortgages, Mario mortgages. That was the first chapter I wrote. <laughs> and I was all over the place. And I don't write fast. I'll write something and I'll change it and I'll edit it and I'll change it. And I'm really careful about how things flow together. So it took two years to write. But the title, Wealthing Like Rabbit, stems from two ideas that are inside the book that I mashed together. One of the examples I used to demonstrate how powerful compound interest can be and how much money can grow upon itself given enough time is I tell the true story of what happened to the rabbit population in Australia. In 1859, there was a farmer there named Thomas Austin. Tom decided he wanted to go rabbit hunting. Problem was there were no rabbits in Australia in 1859. So legend has it that Tom imported 24 rabbits from England, released them onto his farm in Australia, and 60 years later, Australia had 10 billion rabbits. <laughs> it's, it, it's unbelievable. As your listeners may have heard, rabbits are pretty good at compounding. Yes. So I use that story to demonstrate compound interest and in how much money could grow. So that was the like rabbits part. 
And in a different section of the book, I suggest that sometimes we use the word saving improperly and not in a good way. I'll say that I go out and I buy a brand new TV today and because it's on sale, I saved $300 on that TV. Yeah. Well, I would argue you haven't saved anything. You still spent $1,000 on that TV. Perhaps you would have spent more had it not been on sale, but you haven't saved anything. You've still spent $1,000 and now you have a TV. So I introduced the idea that whenever we do any saving that actually makes us wealthier, that contributes to our net wealth by putting money into an RSP or putting it into your bank account or by paying off some debt, something that actually makes you wealthier, we shouldn't call that saving. We should call it wealthing instead to really drill home the point. And I took those two ideas, and actually I can't take I can't take credit for the title. A friend of mine came up with that. I mashed them together to say wealthing like rabbits. So it's a you know obviously a cheeky little play on words to get people's attention, but I think it works. No, it, it's great, and and I, I like all the different perspectives you have in the and the interesting ways of of communicating these uh, some of these being age old concepts that that people just can't wrap their heads around. Like, like uh, the way that you uh, view credit cards, right? We, we got this, this lexicon. I'm, I'm big on how we use words and how mm. it influences us. And we'll go out for lunch and I'll say, you know what? I'm going to pay for lunch with my credit card. Or yeah. I'm going to pay for the gas I put in my car with my credit card. And you know what? When you use your credit card or when we use our credit cards, we're not paying for anything. What we're doing is called borrowing. And now we're in debt. And I honestly believe that a lot of people would be more responsible with their credit cards if sometimes they were just a little bit more literal when they use their credit cards. Imagine if you went to a store, let's say the store is Best Buy. And when you got to Best Buy, you decided you were going to buy a new big screen TV so you can watch the Leafs in the playoffs next year. When you get up to the front of the store, you've, you've chosen your TV and you've put it on one of those carts, you roll it up the store and the cashier scans it through. Imagine, Bo, if they said this, hey, nice big screen TV. Are you going to pay for that big screen TV using cash or your debit card? Or are you going to take out a potentially crippling high interest loan with your credit card because you really don't have any money and can't afford that TV? <laughs> I think that would be awesome because, you know, about 30% of the time, that is exactly what is happening. I, I try to introduce subjects in a way that will get people thinking a little bit differently and get them thinking for themselves a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that, like, that should be the price of uh, if you want that thing now, you should, be, you should have to answer I always say you should have to answer like 20 questions, right? Yeah. It should be mandatory. And you should be asking yourself those questions. Uh, but, and you're, but you're also not a fan of using credit cards uh, for rewards, right? That's probably the one subject that was most controversial in the book. <laughs> and, and I'm not. And, and listen, I do understand that if somebody uses their credit card in a super disciplined way and they're only using the credit card for things they were truly only going to buy anyhow, and they get you know 1.75% as a cashback reward, that there is a little something that they can gain in a mathematical, theoretical way. The thing is, I also understand that it's mathematically, theoretically possible that my Leafs are going to win 16 straight playoff games next spring and win the cup. <laughs> the credit card companies are very, very adept at using techniques to get us to spend more. And there's been just tons and tons of research done that suggests that people who borrow with their credit cards are spending more money than people who buy with cash. And even the super disciplined and aware are probably more susceptible to that than they're aware. And that's within the personal finance community. Once you get outside of that, people who use their credit cards are definitely spending more. So I'm not a big fan of rewards. It's a little reward for doing something that you should, in most cases, be trying to minimize. I honestly believe that if people focus as much on using their credit cards responsibly as they do on their rewards programs, they'd be a lot better off. And and I think uh, you know even if even if you do use your credit card uh, responsibly, like you know you pay it off, you know pay interest, and you get your 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 benefits. I've, I you know I'm realizing especially using a credit card. Also, just enables the the transactions to just float away, and it, it's yeah. it's less tracking. Well, as much as I have the money sitting in my bank account to to pay off my credit card right away, 
uh, I'm not actively making that decision every time as I did when I was when I was uh, living without credit and going, uh, you know, uh, paying off my consumer proposal uh, that I filed and I didn't have any ability to do credit. I had to look at the spreadsheet every time. Yeah. And if yeah. everybody had to do that, it, it would change a lot. Everybody has different seasons in their life when they need to do that. And, and sometimes, you know, you're if everything's taken care of, you don't have to worry about the, you know, the big chunk of money that's left over so much. But but it, if you're having troubles, I do a lot of speaking at colleges and universities. And mm -hmm. and uh, a, a bit of that speech is, you know, warning students about the potential dangers of credit cards. And, and I think it's a couple of things. I think credit cards are so common, so pervasive in our society now that we forget how much potential damage they can cause if they're used improperly. I like to use the analogy, you know, a credit card is like a chainsaw. A chainsaw, if you use it properly for the right job, with the proper training, and with the right safety equipment, is a very valuable tool. If you use a chainsaw without the right equipment, without the right training, then it can do an awful lot of damage. And credit cards, I think, are the same way. And I, whenever I speak about credit cards at colleges and universities, I always reach a point where I say, okay, listen, you know, we're all getting to know each other real well here. I'd like you to all put up your hands with an honest answer, an honest answer to this question. How many people in this room have ever got their credit card bill and been, holy shit, I can't believe I spent <laughs> that much money. And that's exactly what I say. Yeah. 80% of the hands go up. 80% of the people have had that experience where they get a credit card bill for, you know, far more than they expected it to be because they forget using it because there's no pain. And even people that are conscious of it, that happens as well too. So I'm, I'm very, very hesitant to recommend, you know, doing your day-to-day -day spending with a credit card over a debit card or cash because I think at the end of the day, you just end up spending more. So I'm not a big fan of rewards brokers, but I think they encourage a, a behavior that for most people isn't good for their finances. And you gotta ask yourself, why are rewards programs so important to the credit card companies? Because it's good for the consumer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's really like, you know, the more I think about credit cards, it's just it was just a genius move on the on the financial institutions parts to create these instant loans you could yeah. get right like yeah. you don't have to apply for it you have apply for the, to have the availability of of this loan it's just there waiting for you to use instant like, high interest loan i like that i may use that in the next book but please like because it just i just clued into this right now because like you know when you you had to apply for a car loan right didn't you yeah when when you and it, and it even it wasn't that much right 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 it wasn't that much relative to what you could have got and it's credit is so easily accessible now. I, I talk in the book on credit cards about when I took my daughter Jennifer to school at her first day of university and all the credit card companies were, were, were lined up at York University just handing out student credit cards like they're water and students get a Frisbee or a nice t-shirt if they pick up you know $2,000 worth of potential credit. The story I don't tell in the book because it would have gone on too long is when we were coming home that night we stopped at a Loblaws to get some, you know, some groceries. And before I could check out at the automatic checkout, it asked me if I wanted a PC MasterCard. Ah. And by the time we got to our car that day, some other credit card company had put a flyer in my windshield. It's like, <laughs> oh my God. You know, we used to have to fill out forms to get a credit card. And, and you know, when I got that bank loan, and I don't want to date myself. I don't think we should go back to the 1980s no, no. or anything. But when I got that car loan, I had to go to a bank and talk to a bank manager to get that loan. And, yes. you know, I had to prove that I was worthy. You know, they, they've just become credit pushers now. So much easier to get credit now. And sometimes that's dangerous. It's crazy. I have, like, a long time ago, I stopped keeping a balance on credit cards. You know, I don't have any debt, right? Yeah. But I have uh, $33,000 in available credit on two credit cards. Yeah. Like, that if if I wasn't secure <laughs> with, yeah. with credit right now, uh, that's dangerous. That's yeah. super dangerous. Yes, uh, I, I see lots of examples out there like that. It's so easy to get credit now. No one needs that much. No one needs that much. Like it should be as much as a uh, a, tra a biggest the biggest transaction. I always say like the most I've ever put on is probably my uh, the, my flight to Australia because it was over two grand. I don't need well, anything and, more than like $2,500 uh, in the limit. 
And that's typically what I use my credit card for is large planned expenses. So yeah. if I was going on a trip, the flight for sure. Yeah. And, you know, I mentioned I do speaking. So when I fly to Kelowna, obviously I'm going to put that flight on my credit card and the hotel bills are going on the credit card. Those, those business transactions. And uh, uh, if we were to get a large purchase for a house or cottage, that would probably flow through the credit card. But that's just almost convenience of paying. And then, you know, the other thing that I recommend people do when I speak is do not, do not pay your credit card bill off every month. And everybody goes, oh my God, you've been going on for the last five minutes about how important it is to pay your credit card bill every month. I say pay it off every week. <laughs> you know, take the five minutes to go online and, and see where you've spent your credit card each week and pay it off every week. You'll never get into trouble. You'll never pay any interest and fees. But more importantly, it'll help build that awareness of where your spending is going. That's right. It's like, wow, that's a lot of money to pay off every week. <laughs> yeah, and people are shocked at how much you know they spend on credit cards at restaurants, how much money they eat. Yeah, so so credit cards and and mortgages are just a part of your book, but it's it's well rounded, right? You you try to cover uh, cover the bases of personal finance. Yeah, I would like to believe that we touched on the the introductory basics of personal finance, the compound interest, the RSP tax free savings account debate and mortgages and how they work, and I certainly uh, lean people toward buying houses that are practical and make sense, a smaller, reasonable home as opposed to a great big monstrosity home. Talk a lot about spending decisions and things like cars and vacations and weddings and home renovations and try to present those subjects in a way that will get people thinking a little bit differently about how they spend their money and give them a few laughs along the way too. Yeah, because these are, these are the most important things and it's where people, it's not in the lattes that people get lost. No. Right. So sometimes it is. Uh, yeah. But but a lot of it is just like you could have spent fifty thousand dollars less on that thing or the house. Or if you negotiate this or that, you might spend fifty thousand dollars less in interest. Those kind yeah. of things. Those are the big, big things that we should be thinking about. If you buy if you have five dollars a day to spend on, on coffee, it, it, that's kind of your choice as long as everything else is taken care of. Yeah, I would argue you'll more likely have five dollars to spend on coffee if you haven't spent seventy five thousand dollars on your car and yeah. seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on a house and have to maintain those. Seriously. So I know you're just in the in the uh, idea stage, but like what would the next book be about or do you have a theme that you're leaning towards? I'm leaning toward, uh, first of all, reinforcing some of the ideas toward from the original book yeah. and diving into more detail on some subjects sure. and some new subjects. So let me give you some examples. Okay. I, I've been reading a lot recently about some of the behavioral influences in our lives and in personal finance, you know, a confirmation bias and you know, yeah. uh, personality bias, that sort of thing. And I think, I think there's some lessons to be taught in there so that people can be more aware of of how their brain is making them make bad decisions or good decisions. Love it. I, I chose very deliberately not to talk a lot about investing in the first book. I do touch on it a little bit, low cost index funds and, and a later edition of the book actually introduced the robo advisor model, but it's very introductory. I don't dive into things like discount brokerages and really explain, you know, the, the power of going to be an average investor and keeping your fees down will actually turn out better than, you know, shooting for the moon and trying to pick those winning stocks yeah. and going down that road. So I think there's an opportunity to dive into that subject a lot deeper than I did before and some new ideas on spending decisions. Another thing that I didn't do in the first book, and this was a very conscious decision, is I didn't talk a lot about myself or my own situation. Mm -hmm. Sure, there's a couple of little examples where I joke about a little wardrobe that my wife and I bought on Kijiji, and I tell a little story about how my wife and I celebrate Valentine's Day, that little stuff. But other mm -hmm. than that, not a lot. And I think that if I do it well, my cottage story, the story that I just, just yeah, yeah. touched on here, has some value in terms of, talking about how you can achieve goals and still save at the same time and how attitude and ethic, work ethic have something to do with those sort of things, that kind of holistic message. And I have to figure out how to do that because I, I, I don't want it to be, I hate these books, so I'm not going to mention any names. But you know those <laughs> personal finance books that say, hey, I did this, so if you do what I do, you can do it too. Yeah, I don't want it yeah. to be that type of message. But 
yeah, you know what? I think there is a message in saying that, you know, we bought a cottage, fixed up a cottage. And let me say, Bo, our cottage is stunningly beautiful now. And I'm going to be going there in about two hours. And, uh, and we worked hard for it. It was not easy, but we still saved for our future. And there were times when we had to do things in a way that was a lot harder than it would have been had we just picked up the phone and got somebody to do it. But, you know, 21 years later, we're, we're pretty proud of what we've accomplished. So I got to figure out a way to get that message in there in a, in a positive, you know, uh, hopefully a little bit inspirational way. So those are some of the ideas I'm kicking around for the new book. Yeah, that would, that'd be a great chapter. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, uh, introduced on the podcast. Right? Yeah, introduced on the podcast. <laughs> now, I'm, now, I, now I'm under some pressure to actually do it. <laughs> no, that's awesome. You know, just I, I've seen so many people on Twitter and just talk to people who, when somebody says, I don't understand anything in personal finance, was a good book to start with. Uh, everybody says your book. And, oh, and people, thank you. Hey, if people read your book and they say, I didn't understand this until you put it in that, that context. And that, that these are, it's so important that, you know, I always say to people, somebody's out there waiting for you to say the thing in the way that they understand. Wow. That, 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 that's a nice thing to hear. Well, thanks so much. Right. Yeah. That's, and so you, like I, people were waiting, I think for, for you to present these ideas in, cause how many, I mean, how many times before you, right. I've like David Chilton talked about some of them and, you know, like the concepts are not are not new yeah but, but it's the communication and it's it's the getting through like and you're talking to, to universities and colleges and that's that's key right they're the hardest ones to get through to aren't they they are that, that that's that, that's a tough market but one of the nicest compliments i love this story to be honest but one of the nicest compliments i ever got about my book i don't think was intended as a compliment when it was released, I sent copies to all the personal finance editors at all the major newspapers, and I thought I'd get you know front page coverage and all that stuff. But one of them, who, who will remain nameless, he's not there anymore, sent me back a nice email, said, hey, Rob, love your book, well-written, creative, but nothing new. I said, yeah, <laughs> I got it. I got it. I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. <laughs> That's a nice thing to say, but you're right. Pay yourself first isn't new. Compound interest isn't new. Managing your credit cards responsibly isn't new. I think I got people thinking a little bit differently about things like rewards programs and buying houses within your means. There wasn't a lot of books out there that sure, took yeah, the of course. that I did there. The, the world we live in, everybody says, well, buy as much real estate as you can. No, I'm not convinced that's the way to go. I also said that renting is not a waste of money. So a lot of people, you know, they are, oh, man, you rent, you're throwing away your money. No, no, you're not. You're, you're paying to have a roof over your head and, you know, if, if a renter is smart and invests the tons of money that they're saving by renting instead of buying, they could do quite well over time. So I tried to introduce some new ideas as well. Yeah. What, you know, whatever uh, keeps the conversation going and, and opens it up, like th this is really great stuff. So thanks so much for coming on the show, Rob. This is, uh, it's been a long time coming. Yeah, it has been. We've been, we've been talking about this for a while and just uh, our lives didn't allow us to do it live. So uh, we decided <laughs> to do it remotely and I, I think it was okay. Uh, me too. Me too. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Bo. And that was episode 91 with Robert Brown. If you like the podcast and want to see me get to episode 100 and beyond, please support the podcast by going to my Patreon site and becoming a patron. It's only a few bucks a week, but if enough people do it, starts to add up head over to patreon.com slash bow humphreys if you're interested i am now offering free 15 minute personal finance consultations online so what's a personal finance consultation well it's just a confidential chat about money no judgment no pressure i want to provide a safe space to ask a few questions or just talk about financial stuff that's on your mind that's totally free and after the 15 minutes, if you think continuing to talk with me about your finances might be helpful, I charge $50 per hour. I can't make any promises, but just having a conversation about your goals or what you're currently doing could potentially save you thousands of dollars in fees or just by making the right decision. The perfect example is Owen Winkle Mullen from episode 78 of the show. He decided while he was waiting for the right house to pop up that he would invest his $30,000 down payment in one stock just before the market crashed in 2008. He lost half of that money within two weeks. 
Now, I don't give financial advice. I can't legally tell you to specifically invest in a stock or any financial product. But what I can do if someone comes to me with a situation like Owen's and says, I'm tired of waiting for the perfect house. I just want to do something with this money. I can ask questions like, do you want to buy a house in the next few years? And if the answer is yes, then I can say, don't invest that money in anything. It should be in a safe place, protected from market fluctuations like a savings account. If you still want to invest that money and you tell me that you want to put it in one stock, I can inform you of how risky it is to put all of your money in one place. I can explain diversification of investments and why that's important. One hour of coaching with me could have saved Owen $15,000 and it would have been worth the $50. That's it for this episode. I'll be back next week with award-winning author and personal finance educator, Kelly Keene.